Thank you. Uh, geopolitics is what my company specializes in, the Eurasia Group. Uh, it was actually part of one of a number of risk things we used to do, but geopolitics is now uh, by, far, by far one of the biggest selling points we have to our roughly 1,000 clients around the world. Uh, because if you read the newspapers, you watch the news, you'll realize that uh, countries are at war. They like to fight with each other these days much more than they used to. But also domestic politics in a lot of countries has become a lot more, uh, should we say, rambunctious. So I'll begin by pointing out, I hope some of you may have seen the, some of the highlights of the Biden-Trump uh, debate, presidential debate. While the focus is obviously on, on Biden's uh, senior moments, um, <clears throat> the, uh, my daughter watched them and said, Dad, you're not too far behind. Um, but the real thing um, was, I thought, was that Trump stayed on message in the sense that while he didn't say anything factually correct, what he did say was immigration is a problem, immigration is a problem, immigration is the source of the problem. He didn't quite say that Biden's problems are because of immigration, but he might have said it. Um, but ultimately, he stayed on message. He just said immigration, immigration, immigration is a problem to the United States. Um, and it is by far the single, arguably the single most important issue uh, for the support behind Trump uh, in the Republican Party to, in, in, this, in this election. It is also a major issue in, the, in Europe, the rise of the right-wing parties, Marine Le Pen in France, and in other parts of Europe, continental Europe, uh, even in places like Scandinavia, for example, parts of the world, Europe which have never traditionally had a problem uh, on immigration, we've seen a rise of, of anti-immigrant sentiment. Now, a couple of points to be made on this is that this is happening at a time and when many of these countries, notably the United States and the Nordic countries as well, there is very high employment levels. Traditionally, anti-immigrant sentiment has gone along with a drop in employment. Job losses result in uh, anti-immigrant sentiment. This time, there doesn't seem to be a connection. Despite and high employment figures, when Biden said in the debate, uh, America has record low unemployment levels, he was completely right. It was still going along with anti-immigrant sentiment. This is true in the Nordic countries as well. If you look at the polls in, in the, uh, coming out of Europe, where are we seeing highest levels of anti-immigrant sentiment? Uh, Nordics are in the top, uh, you know, top five or six, and but their employment levels are very, uh, our unemployment levels are really low. Um, so what is what's happening here? But the flip side to this, and that's the broad anti-immigrant sentiment, and a lot of it is about illegal migrants and and so on. Um, is a hunt for a lot of governments looking for skilled manpower. Every government you talk to in the West, in the developed world, and this includes Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, China, um, saying, and even to some degree India, uh, saying we have a skilled manpower problem here. Uh, we're hunting for people on a whole host of levels. Um, and Trump, for example, very soon after this debate, came out and said that every foreign student who graduates in America will get a green card. His, his aides then came in, so that he's, he's also a little old and he's talking a little over his hat, but this, this, that sentiment is very clearly part of this, his campaign, that we need to get avenues for skilled manpower into the country because they're listening to American industry and they're saying we need people uh, of a certain qualification. Um, so this is a curious dichotomy, and I'll try to look at that, plus some other curious developments we're starting to see. For example, um, when uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Vladimir Putin will meet a few days from now um, in Moscow uh, for their first summit meeting since, what, 2021, um, one of the things on the agenda will be immigration. Russia needs workers of certain varieties. Uh, India is a little unhappy that some of Indian workers who have already gone there were promptly dragooned and sent off to be fighting in the Ukraine front, which they hadn't expected. Um, <clears throat> but again, in a country where traditionally we haven't had much immigration concerns or interest 
this is now part of, uh, uh, right on the top of the agenda. So look at some of the, I'm trying to go to some of the broader trends that I see glowing around globally on, on immigration. Now, a key problem that we're starting to see in the West, and this is triggering a lot of the anti, broad anti-immigrant sentiment, is the question of assimilation. The sense that immigrants from different cultures, um, Africans, Arabs in Europe, for example, little less so in the United States where it's more about uh, maybe Spanish speakers. Um, but for example, in, in Britain, uh, it was actually a bit strange because the Brexit movement led by uh, Nigel Farage, uh, the head of the, <coughs> of the, at that point, the UK Independence Party, uh, in interviews he would say that, I don't have a problem with Indians and Australians coming to England. I have a problem with Portuguese and Poles coming to England. Why? Because the Indians and the Australians they speak English and they play cricket. So I understand them. They're, they're halfway to being an Englishman. But these Poles and Portuguese, they don't do anything. I don't understand what they're saying. And they don't play cricket because they find it boring. So therefore, I have a problem with these type of immigrants. But this assimilation issue is very strongly now embedded in the West, that there are sense that these new waves of immigrants, many of them not, should be becoming like us, and then that, that's not happening. They're either ghettoizing or they're insisting on... on uh, now, some studies argue that's actually exaggerated, but social media is making it a, a, a thing. Whatever, the perception is there, uh, and that's all that matters as far as politics is concerned. But assimilation is a huge issue. Um, the second plot, and I think very, probably most important, especially in places like the United States, is working class, um, the hollowing out of manufacturing jobs. And this is becoming a big economic issue. It's also becoming a geopolitical issue, which is that America allowed for a long time a lot of the manufacturing sector jobs to leave the country, go to initially Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, and now China, um, because it argued that under neoliberal economic thinking, corporations should be allowed to seek higher returns, and one of the ways was to seek lower labor costs. It also was geopolitically useful for the United States, and so they expanded their sphere of influence uh, among those countries that benefited from American investment going to their, to their lands. And it boosted Wall Street, because these companies obviously became more profitable. The assumption was those workers would find new kinds of jobs, preferably by skilling upwards and going up the value addition ladder. Unfortunately, and a lot of them ended up just working in Starbucks uh, or not working at all. Um, and that is triggering itself uh, a class war that is feeding in, if you say the trade war, is trade is feeding into a class war. Uh, and this is, again, re giving rise to the far-right uh, populism of people like Trump or things like Brexit, because a very similar thing happened in Britain, and we're now seeing that spread in, into, into France uh, and other parts of the, um, <clears throat> of the West. And then finally, another, well, another element is demographics, because there is another problem, which is these are all aging populations. Um, I was talking recently to, to some Taiwanese diplomats, and I said, where should India fit into the semiconductor thing? They said, you guys should get into the fab manpower side because that's where nobody's looking. The four, if you exclude China as geopolitically outside of your supply chain, where are the three big fab manpower centers? Korea, South Korea that is, Japan, and Taiwan. Um, the joke was that you, you had to be from a country that used chopsticks to be able to make fabs. Um, and to, to, to run a fab. All of these are the fastest aging populations in the world. Negative, massively negative population, growth rate, demographics that are a complete disaster. Um, and he says, Where, who's going to run all these fabs? 150 fabs are being built around the world right now, most of which will go bankrupt. But what is, who's going to run them? Nobody's looking at that. Um, this is, so what you're seeing here is another additional problem, and this is a geopolitical problem. Uh, and this is, I'll go into some of the geopolitics that you're seeing. The biggest one, of course, is US versus China, which is that the US versus China is increasingly spilling out into skilled manpower shifts. 
Chinese youth are still just about the largest international student population in America. About a million students come to America every year. About 30, 35% traditionally were Chinese. I think it peaked at about 40. That's now shrinking rapidly. Indians are now neck and neck. We're about 26 to 27 percent of the latest batch of international students. One or two percentage points less than the Chinese. We'll probably overtake them in a few years. Why? Because the Chinese are finding it harder to get visas. They're finding it, they're scared to go to the United States because they're facing, especially when they enter high-end STEM areas, they're literally facing uh, concerns about espionage. Uh, the Trump administration actually had laws on that to that effect, that there are certain areas, certain technologies where if you are of Chinese origin, you will have to undergo special surveillance as a student, as a professor, as a researcher, uh, which obviously was not led many, many Chinese students to avoid it. But there's also, a, there's also a pull factor in the sense that the Chinese government is dissuading them from going, saying we need people like you to stay back in China because we need to be independent and, and big players in advanced, what are now being called advanced industrial areas. Uh, quantum computing, AI, so on, green hydrogen, you name it. Um, so that's a, that's a broad macro thing that's now starting to affect. Companies are reluctant, will think twice. If it's a person of Indian origin, person of Chinese origin, and I'm making jet engines, probably if everything else is equal, I'll go with the Indian uh, <clears throat> because I probably have a slightly less concern about, uh, about uh, security issues. Um, I mean, this is spreading to a large number of very sensitive technology areas, uh, but it's also spreading into a larger perception that these, these two countries are not places, their citizens don't necessarily want to go to each other. You can see the number of Americans visiting China, even as tourists, forget about working there or studying there, has dropped dramatically. I think they're now down to barely 20,000 Americans. There used to be several, a couple of hundred thousand there before. Um, and you can see that, obviously, as I've mentioned, with Chinese going to the United States. Um, and it's spreading to other countries as well. I mean, India and China, obviously, we don't even have airplane flights anymore between the two of us. Um, though that's a different, slightly different geopolitical game, but it's broadly a very similar area. Um, and of course, the type of people involved are different. But as we can see in India, a lot of companies are complaining that we need Chinese technicians. There are areas where China is the only source of manpower and electronics and so on. So we're starting to see the Indian government tinker with that a little bit, but broadly, if you're Chinese, trying to get a visa to India, pretty difficult. Uh, you need to have a very big and powerful corporate sponsor to make a very strong argument to the Ministry of Home Affairs as to why this person is necessary. But what is interesting now, we're starting to see other geopolitical divides. Russia, for example. As Russian sanction, the sanctions regime comes to impose on Russia after the Ukraine war. Europeans who were working in Russian factories as managers, uh, technical uh, engineers, all fled and left Poles and Ukrainians and fled Russia uh, or left Russia because their companies said you have to come back. Um, Russia, and then on top of that, you now recently had two major terrorist attacks in Russia by Central Asians, people mainly of Tajik origin, working on behalf of the Islamic, the newly re-emerged Islamic State coming out of Afghanistan. Um, end result, Central Asians are the, we used to provide the bulk of the lower end workers in Russia, uh, construction and so on, no longer welcome. So what, is in, what are the Russians, they're coming to India. They're trying to get engineers, but then they sent a few to the Ukraine war front and nobody wants to go there anymore. But they are trying now to get lower end workers to come and fill in those gaps in Central Asia. So you had a whole set of repercussions, if you wish, coming out of the Ukraine war uh, that are also changing. Gaza conflict, what has happened? Israel thrown out Palestinian workers. So agricultural workers being imported from overseas mostly from Sri Lanka, I believe, is what is how people are signing up. But construction workers are coming from India. And they've asked for 100,000 workers, as some of you probably have read. And they're starting to see groups, batches, the first batches of them going off, off, off to work, work in Israel. Um, 
So you see these little micro shifts that are taking place in immigration patterns. And they're working curiously on, very, on many different levels. Uh, at the highest level, at advanced industrial, sensitive, critical technology areas, all the way down to farm labor and construction. So many that it's actually sometimes very hard to map them. And it's not clear necessarily how many people are necessarily entering the doors that are opening up. Uh, you know, we're not seeing that many Indians, for example, doing farm work in, in Israel. As I mentioned, it's been mainly Sri Lankans who've gone there. Um, but we're seeing these opportunities coming up. Now, I think what I'd focus on a little here is just looking at the, the technology end, end of it. Um, what we're seeing now is, uh, you know, the Quad, for example, is the, the four, the US, Japan, Australia, India relationship, is a technology alliance. And it fundamentally comes down to a belief that China's technological, or China's geopolitical, um, should we say, target is to dominate these critical technologies. And part of that, obviously, is because they, they feel they have the manpower. Um, but as a consequence of this and fears of supply chain disruptions that we saw in COVID and we've seen in other places, American companies in particular, followed somewhat more slowly by European companies, are one, building alternative supply chains. Apple doesn't have to build its assembly lines in, in India, in Tamil Nadu. It was doing perfectly well in China. But it fears that between sanctions, the Taiwan conflict, it may suddenly find itself with its China supply chains badly disrupted or cut off. So build alternatives. Samsung has them moved already to Vietnam, but they're building a Vietnam Plus strategy because of the same concerns. What if the South China Sea explodes tomorrow? Um, and then my supply chains off of Vietnam are cut off. Basically, don't be dependent on any single place. So you build alternative supply chains. But the result is a sort of supply chains multiplying across the world Often, you know, if you're a really giant company, you can build a China plus, plus, plus category if you want. But you now need manpower for all of them. A lot of this is, doesn't make any economic sense. That's not the issue. It's about risk management more than it is about, it's now much, much more about risk management than it is necessarily about the fattest profit margin you can do. In fact, quite the opposite. A lot of your shareholders are saying, are you handling this risk? Um, you know, I was in Finland and I was talking to companies there who lost, one company lost 7 billion euros because of the Ukraine war. And they said, we just didn't really thought it, we didn't think it was going to happen. Nobody believed that there'd be a major war in Europe anymore. That, that era was over. And we got caught completely flat-footed. Um, and as a consequence now, they're saying we're building multiple supply chains, we're building everything, and the board is saying, don't worry about the money, cover the risk. That's what we need to know first. So you're seeing this multiplication of supply chains, net result, shortage of skilled manpower. Even China is saying that 35 million people short of people on the shop floor. This is the, not just the, that's not the high end, but the guys who actually sit down and make stuff on an assembly line or manage an assembly line. Then on top of that, as I mentioned, you have the critical emerging technology race. Who's going to lead in AI and quantum in green hydrogen, in synthetic biology. These are the areas of the 20, 30, 40 of these technologies. Everybody is racing. All the major countries are racing to be major players in this or working only with certain countries who they feel safe with. The Quad is a perfect example. Um, those guys, are based on that area, you can see the government saying, we'll open the visas, we'll open the universities, we'll spend money, we'll create fellowships. The Quad fellowships, for example, is a perfect example. Uh, because this is strategically important for us. India is, if you're a labor, on the labor side, it's a sweet spot in many ways for India. Minus China, we're considered one of the safer players to play. We Indians assimilate well, they already have a good reputation for technology, um, and they're shifting, and they can see, a, you know, for a country like everybody from Russia to even Europe to some extent, but definitely America, still seeing the door is open. Uh, for Indians to come, that's a good sign for an Indian. It's not necessarily good for Indian industry. Uh, Indian industry then has to work out how do you retain these people or how do you at least keep them coming through my, onto my shop floor for a while or work for me. In many ways, building up, helping build up the CV 
for these workers. Because what's increasingly happening is in the past, you need to worry mainly about, you, you often were a tech worker who went looking for citizenship at the end of the door, at the end of the road. Now it's much more, in my view, that sensible ones are realizing, no, if I can go to Taiwan, work in a fab factory for three or four years, move on, I become globally competitive. Everybody wants me. Taiwan won't give me citizenship. But that's not important. The game is to be able to say, I worked in TSMC shop floor for two years. I can charge, you can, I can charge anything I want. Uh, there's a million jobs for me. That's the kind of thing now the sensible workers are starting to realize. And I think we're going to start to see that shift moving into more and more technologies over time. Synthetic biology. People are looking at that. That's one of the top three cri priorities within the quad among governments, because it's about DNA weaponization. And dominance in that technology is going to see huge amounts of money pouring into that area. It's not something most people are looking at right now, but it's one of the areas. Um, so there's a whole bunch of stuff. A lot of this is still, if you wish, coming together. Labor, ironically, labor stats are really bad in telling us where migration shifts are taking place. AI, definitely, we can see the numbers are very clear. Uh, but a lot of other technologies, it's not so evident. And we'll see them play out over time. Um, but the battle for skilled manpower, the battle for really high-end technology workers, has really taken off. And ironically, we're also seeing, as I mentioned, in a more niche fashion, a lot of these specialized, uh, lower-end workers also coming into demand because of strange geopolitical fissures that nobody has understood. And India, in many ways, does reasonably well in all of this because other than China, uh, we're actually more or less friends with almost everybody else. Why don't I end there and just see if there are any questions before I go on? Not that I can see if anybody has any. OK, no, so anyway, so I'll just continue one final point, is that the Persian Gulf is another area uh, where you're seeing a lot of demand. Um, that's always been a huge area for labor movement out of India. The prop, what's interesting is now is that a lot of these countries, Saudi Arabia and UAE in particular, are positioning themselves as technology hubs. They're trying to build themselves up as this is the place for startups, this is the place to come and make money, also to pay really low levels of tax. Uh, why don't you all come here? Um, and that's what we're seeing definitely in India. A lot of people are using Dubai as a base of operations. Um, or a place to, to set up. Indian government, somewhat unhappy about this, but ultimately there's not much they can do about it for the time being. And the UAE sweetening the pie by pouring a lot of money into India. But that's another area you're going to see. But again, it's not a place for citizenship per se, but it's, it is a place to do for entrepreneurs more than anywhere else, I would argue. But keep an eye out. But if, if I'm a tech worker in India now, the options I have are quite remarkable. I mean, if you look at, I was looking the other day at a list of countries that were saying governments with the highest degree of skilled manpower shortage. The number two country on that list was Slovakia. And I was thinking, what's Slovakia? Uh, it's true, it has no people. I also didn't know it had any industry. Uh, but the point was that it, it is a country that is having a, a, both a demographic problem, it's thrown out its Russian population, it has a problem of workers. Um, and is looking for people. Again, not a place that Indians, I think, would come on our radar, really. And it's probably more likely Ukrainians and so on who would go there. Uh, but you're, it's, it's one of the growing prob little spots that you're happening uh, all over the place. Um, I expect that America will remain the, by far the biggest magnet. Even now, the bulk of Americans believe immigration, especially legal migration and educated migration, is a good thing for the country. And Trump's team, who are geopolitically extraordinarily hostile to China, uh, are very clear, I think, in their mind, if they come back to power, which seems likely, it doesn't really make any difference, I think, on that front with Biden as well, that they will be have an immigration policy designed to bring in even more skilled manpower uh, in, into their country uh, over time because they see this as a strategic imperative. Um, so we'll see that develop over time, but I think manpower, skilled manpower, but labor trends globally are going to be remarkably, uh, dramatically different and more radical than they have been 
I think, in the past 20 or 30 years. Let me end there. For more content on tech and leadership, subscribe to NASCOM YouTube channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update.